Good afternoon. My name is Adriana Link, and I'm head of scholarly programs at the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to the fourth day of the APS's virtual symposium, The Promise and Pitfalls of Citizen Science. I'm glad that so many of you have joined us today. The American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance and expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who have offered their guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. This week's conference is inspired by the Society's 2021 exhibition, Dr. Franklin, Citizen Scientist, and expands on the exhibition's themes by exploring understandings of citizen science over time, placing historical initiatives in conversation with present day projects, as well as reflecting on the future needs and opportunities of the movement. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities and public life. The society promotes research by providing over a million and a half dollars in research grants a year, primarily to younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Please check out our website, www.amphilsoc.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. We're using Zoom webinar today, so not to worry, you have all been muted. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. And we encourage you to type your questions in there at any time during today's presentations. There will be time at the end of the panel for questions with our speakers. We also encourage you to keep the conversation going on the APS's social media accounts using the hashtag SitSciAPS, and you can see that in the slide on your screen. Papers from today's speakers are available for download from the conference website and may be accessed using the passcode SITSci2021. Finally, we are very excited to offer closed captioning for the conference. If you would like to use it during the panel, please click on the CC box on the bottom navigation bar of Zoom. It is to the right of the Q&A button. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce the presenters for today's panel on global perspectives. First up, Pavel Vasiliev is a senior lecturer at HSE University in St. Petersburg and a junior research fellow at Siberian State Medical University. He holds a doctorate from the St. Petersburg Institute of History of the Russian Academy of Sciences and was previously a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for the History of Emotions in Berlin and at the Polanski Academy in Jerusalem. He is currently working on a history of clinical trials in the Soviet Union in its global context, which is part of an interdisciplinary study titled Balancing Knowledge, Reliability, and Ethical Acceptability in Clinical Trials from Emergence of a Randomized Controlled Trial to Precision Medicine. The project brings together and advances biomedical science, historical and social studies of science, technology, and medicine, and bioethics to provide a foundation for adequate and responsible balancing between scientific robustness and ethical considerations in clinical trials. Next, we'll hear from John Doyle Rosso, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Michigan State University. His dissertation in progress is about the creation and implementation of the national policy for wetland conservation in Uganda. He has a dual masters in international and world history from Columbia University and the London School of Economics, for which he wrote a thesis about the water politics of the Nile Basin after the construction of the Owen Falls Dam in Uganda. His other research interests include histories of invasive fish and plant species in Lake Victoria. Finally, we'll hear from Ying Chuan Yang, who is a doctoral candidate in the History East Asia program at Columbia University. He works at the intersection of knowledge, often in the form of science and technology, culture and politics in China's long 20th century. His dissertation, Revolution on Air, Mass Technology and the Demise of Chinese Socialism, reveals the unexpected and fateful consequences when the Chinese socialist state actually achieved one of its goals, the state-sponsored production and circulation of radio gadgets and technical know-how. By redirecting the scholarly attention on Chinese socialism away from its institutional organizations to its material base, 
His dissertation offers a fresh perspectives on uh, socialist China with emphasis on previously ignored actors and through a technological lens. So with that, I'll turn it over to our speakers. Yes, thank you so much, Adriana, for the introduction. And uh, I'm really glad to be here and be able to present my uh, research. This is a work in progress. And you already indicated that it's a, a part of a larger um, study. Um, so a lot of uh, what I'm doing here today is actually done in collaboration with my colleagues. So if we can have the next slide, please. Um, right, so that's uh, the title of the larger project. And uh, we also have a student project uh, on uh, the history of uh, drug development and testing in Russia. Uh, here at HSC, we aspire to become world's first project-based university by the year 2030, whatever it might mean. Uh, so we do a lot of project-based learning, and this is also uh, something that I'm trying to introduce uh, at the university. So I really acknowledge the help of uh, students who participated in this uh, project uh, during the two academic years. Um, and if you are curious about the first results of our study, you can check out uh, the, these two publications, one which is already out and another is forthcoming in clinical trials uh, in a few months, it's already accepted for publication on uh, the organization of clinical trials in the uh, late Soviet uh, Union. So for the paper today, I hope that you've all had a chance to have a look at it and uh, I will mostly focus on the things which are not so much in the paper and uh, indeed in the broader context of uh, this study. And you can always come back to the paper for, for more details. And next slide, please. Right, so I want to start with a uh, somewhat you know, general question. Uh, why study the history of clinical trials, um, which is uh, one of the central questions for this larger research project, uh, which involves not only historians like myself, but also sociologists and anthropologists of medicine, um, and uh, actually some medical practitioners and bioethicists as well. So uh, obviously in the current moment of the pandemic, um, a lot was said about clinical trials, especially in relation to, to vaccines. Um, but uh, when we started the project a few years ago, um, we had uh, several considerations, which you can see on this slide. So on the one hand, uh, the research in the history of clinical trials might serve its purpose by just making accessible the results of previously unpublished studies. And this is especially relevant in non-Western uh, settings. It can also interestingly serve as a kind of historical control of uh, studies which are being conducted today. And I think this is a very fresh and interesting direction of inquiry. But the one which is uh, underlined here is uh, probably our main goal, just to highlight the diversity of models for drug development and testing that were um, employed throughout human history. And thus, I think, um, implicitly to a decent uh, and perhaps to contextualize the um, currently dominant uh, RCT model, uh, which uh, only emerged in the second half of the 20th century, really, and especially in the, in the West. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So what we focus on and uh, what most of my current work is about is uh, politics of pharmacological innovation and drug testing in the Soviet Union, or what we might call socialist pharma politics. And uh, one interesting feature of socialist pharma politics, it's, it's focus on effectiveness, um, testing in the real world, so to say, in the messy conditions of actual healthcare, and with an emphasis uh, on treatment, rather than laboratory testing, focusing on efficacy. So trying to observe all the ideal conditions uh, of the scientific experiment to create the most reliable knowledge. As you can imagine, this is precisely the tension between ethical uh, considerations and, uh, so say, epistemological ones, uh, which Adriana already alluded to. There are a few studies of socialist pharma politics right now, most on the example of East Germany, um, which demonstrate both its uh, local constraints, uh, political and social, infrastructural, but also global entanglements, trying to shatter the notion that uh, socialist pharma politics was only confined uh, to uh, the second world and never really interacted with other parts of the world during the Cold War. Uh, 
And I'm also trying to put this study in the context of larger discussions, which uh, drug history scholars today uh, have about uh, so-called pharmaceuticalization of everyday life in the second half of the 20th century, and obviously the Cold War context. Next slide, please. So uh, how does a citizen science come into play here? Um, again, you can read a bit more in, in my paper, but uh, I want to emphasize these two processes, uh, the programs of inventiveness, is and uh, efficiency drive or rationalization drive in Russian, uh, which the Soviets uh, employed, especially actively after the Second World War. And there are a number of scholars now who engage with these two programs, uh, for example, Alexei Golubev. And uh, basically, they aspire to create mass scientific literacy uh, and to ensure that every Soviet citizen has an understanding and uh, can actually uh, sort of handle the scientific facts and apply them in their lives. But as again Golubev shows, and I hope as I show in my paper as well, uh, these programs can also backfire and uh, often they result in attempts uh, that run counter to the original intentions of the state. And uh, in fact, um, they result in attempts to smuggle in uh, different forms of you know, parascientific knowledge, uh, folk medicine, and so on and so forth. So that's where my study uh, comes in. And uh, if we can have the next slide, please. Thank you. So, so the sources that I'm looking at, the primary sources are most archival collections of the Soviet Ministry of Health uh, at the State Archive of the Russian Federation in Moscow. So the documents that I looked at for the purposes of this paper are primarily letters that were sent uh, between the local innovators on the ground in different republics and different cities of the Soviet Union and the pharmacological committee, which is the central drug regulator in Moscow. So you can think of it as uh, the Soviet FDA. And uh, just a bit no short note on the methods. Uh, I'm inspired by this new drug history, which emphasizes larger social and cultural uh, context of uh, drug development and testing, and also by uh, approaches to the study of pharmacological innovation from the field of science and technology studies, STS. Uh, but I'm really also looking uh, forward to learning more, and uh, I'm really grateful for any suggestions and methodological or kind of theoretical framework that you think could be suitable for this study. And next slide is just really an example of how it looks. It's an example of such a letter. Um, to the pharmacological committee. And uh, next slide, please. Right, so um, what I think I'm, I'm trying to show in the, in the paper, you can again read more empirical material in, in, in the text itself, that uh, the early Cold War presented new opportunities for Soviet innovators um, who were not employed at major research institutes or universities. Uh, some of these innovators came from uh, smaller uh, you know, cities and towns across um, the Russian Federation and across the Soviet Union. Uh, some of them belonged uh, to, to ethnic and other minorities. And uh, it's striking that they really learned to employ the emerging nationalist and autarkic rhetoric of the early Cold War and the um, Soviet-American competition to advance their initiatives in drug innovation and even to claim certain supremacy over established forms of biomedical knowledge, uh, primarily as represented by this kind of rational scientific um, Soviet medicine. And Next slide, please. So what does it mean for the larger studies of uh, citizen science? I think this, this case demonstrates uh, something uh, quite important. Um, we tend to focus too much, I think, on the Western societies and Western citizen science. Uh, recently, there was some uh, push also to explore citizen science in the context of Global South, uh, which I think uh, we also just continue this uh, conversation 
uh, later, uh, but in what used to be called the second world in the absence of private property and market relations and indeed very questionable concept of uh, you know, citizenship itself. What does Soviet citizenship mean uh, as compared to, to American, for example? Uh, there were still significant opportunities for these local drug innovators, even though there were also some uh, constraints as I showed in the paper. And the second point that I wish to make is about the embeddedness of the Soviet biomedical knowledge within the larger political context of uh, late Stalinism and also the you know, early Cold War, uh, which uh, again probably is not uh, surprising, uh, but uh, it really struck me to what to what extent uh, the politics of pharmacological innovation uh, was. Uh, colored by this uh, political and ideological language and how successfully the performance of uh, ideological purity uh, often was. Again, uh, I think there are some parallels to uh, the discussions that we witness uh, that, that are going on um, around the world today, especially um, in relation to the uh, so-called uh, vaccine race. I think um, I'll stop uh, here. And I'm really looking forward to your feedback and uh, questions on the paper. Many thanks. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And thank you to the American Philosophical Society, uh, especially to Dr. Adriana Link for coordinating the panels. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, on November 22nd, 2018, the editorial cartoonist of the Ugandan news, uh, government newspaper, New Vision, depicted a flock of breeding gray crown cranes meeting a cob, forming an image of the Ugandan coat of arms. The cob asks, hey, do you cranes know what family planning is? The crane replies, we want to send a message to investors who degrade wetlands that destroying our bedrooms will not affect our stamina. Another sits on a large pile of eggs. Pairs of breeding cranes surrounded by floating hearts fly above. The cartoon cob has genitalia, which are not part of the official coat of arms. In addition to altering the coat of arms, Mr. Raz took artistic license with the cranes. While ornithologists tried to humanize cranes, frequently pointing out that they're monogamous for life, this created room for people to reimagine cranes' reproductive behavior. Unlike in the cartoon, breeding cranes are territorial. They don't flock and lay only two or three eggs at a time, uh, not a pile. Beyond these superficial differences, the fundamental resilience of these cartoon cranes undercut a message that ornithologists promoted, that if the nesting place of a pair of cranes is degraded, they will not find a new one. Mr. Raz's caption for this cartoon, like the newspaper article it followed, claimed that while the crane population had declined for decades, it was starting to rebound. This contrasts with the position of the founding director of the National Biodiversity Database at Makerere University, Dr. Herbert Tushabe, who said in an interview that the trajectory still remained downward even at the time. Despite these discrepancies, uh, Ugandans have found cohesion between the politics invoked here regarding class inequality, environmental conservation, and family planning when discussing crane reproduction. This began with the work of a group of ornithologists and the people who participated in their citizen science programs. The government newspaper New Vision was crucial in connecting these groups. While about half of its readership in the early 21st century has been in Kampala, it still has a wider geographical reach than any other print media in Uganda. Uh, the newspaper offered straightforward promotion of conservationist activities, plus broader cultural engagement with cranes by publishing letters to the editor about the social significance of cranes and by reproducing localized stories for national audiences about cranes as physical and spiritual beings. This is why the author of New Vision's romance and sex column, Dr. Love, wrote an entry about the decline of the bird's population called Mr. Crane, the faithful husband. He told readers, quote, I'm now passing as a very responsible conservationist because if you got to see a chance to see Mr. and Mrs. Crane preparing for a hot secret between the sheets, you would learn a few lessons in that subject. And that, quote, when they are not in heat, they are a peaceful pair and only get annoyed when some policemen participate in evicting people, end quote. He promoted conservation so that, quote, we shall tell our grandchildren that there used to be a monogamous bird called the crane. I hope the word monogamy will not be extinct by then. Quote. Crucially, the campaign for crane conservation relied almost entirely on voluntary participation. Despite having created the second, the second national policy in the world for wetland conservation, the government put little funding into policy implementation, instead relying on individual initiative and international NGOs to create community programs. 
It's partly because of this autonomy required of people outside these organizations, if they were to participate in these conservation programs, uh, that the Kampala-based conservationists have had little control over discourse regarding cranes across Uganda. People have applied ideas about crane reproduction to debates that conservationists had not necessarily intended to pursue. However, the work of NGOs augmented that of the government, both in its early years or in the early years of the program when there were only two officials tasked with wetland conservation nationwide, and since the 1990s as a way to limit government spending and decentralized responsibility for social services, from, from tourism-based conservation in initiatives to behavior-based AIDS programs. The focus of wetland conservationists on crane reproduction as a place-bound monogamous phenomenon enabled the creation of a campaign that engaged people around the country. Discussing Crane's bedrooms became part of implementing the national wetlands policy because of Ugandans' knowledge rooted in local cultures, in nationalist symbolism, and in Ugandan governmental priorities. Um, thank you. Uh, people across Uganda have received Crane conservationist messages differently. Um, but in each region, children and adults have participated in the public projects. Participation is strongest in the Southwest, where the largest population of cranes in Uganda remain. Other approaches to cranes, including domestication or use in medicines designed to facilitate monogamy, sometimes called, quote, love potions, uh, as well as accounts of cranes as spiritual entities are present in Southwestern Uganda and other parts of the country. Ugandan conservationists attribute the continued survival of cranes to, in the Southwest, partly to the cultural values associated with cranes by the Ankole and Chiga peoples of Southwestern Uganda. The conservationists often point to the Bahinda clan, whose primary totem is a crane, and from whom all the kings of Ankole come. There's also a historical connection between cranes and marriage in Ankole. Uh, or, uh, marriage in, uh, in Ankole. Um, according to an interview with Stephen Rongyezi, founding director of the Ndere Cultural Center, and an Ankole elder whose mother was from the Bahinda clan, uh, Ankole people connected cranes with marriage into the 20th century. Um, prior to weddings, women performed akachera for the bride-to-be, going from house to house singing songs that included lyrics about marriage and calls that imitated the crane. Uh, this practice had all but ended by 1968 when Wangyezi's sister married and there was no akachera. Uh, still, ideas about the crane endured. For example, a 1982 poem about the crane framed it as a symbol of love, peace, reconciliation, and beauty among Ankole people. Uh, crucially, the poet did not specify what kind of love. Wangyezi finds it, quote, strange, end quote, that people would promote crane conservation at Ankole based on monogamy, saying it is common there for people to have sexual relationships with the siblings of their spouse. Moreover, in the other region of Ugandan crane conservationist focus, the Southeast, polygamy was common throughout the 20th century. Um, next, uh, next slide, thank you. Um, Ugandan conservationists did not focus on the monogamy of cranes until the AIDS crisis. Uh, Jimmy Mohebwa, the head of the crane and conservation program started by the NGO Nature Uganda, borrowed the idea of explicitly connecting cranes and monogamy from eulogies that he heard at Christian funerals in the 2000s when, quote, everyone in Uganda knew someone who died from AIDS, end quote. The behavior-focused approach to AIDS taken by government and NGO actors in Uganda has featured abstinence and monogamy, and monogamy prominently. Christian eulogists use, no use knowledge about a widely familiar bird to connect to the prevailing discourses, and crane conservationists use ideas from Christian eulogies to promote wetland conservation based on a pro-monogamy discourse. Uh, Nature Uganda personnel have also begun using the crane to promote family planning and environmental conservation simultaneously. This new collaboration is based on the argument that family planning will reduce, quote, pressures on families themselves and the local ecosystems, end quote. The organizational basis is a partnership between Nature Uganda, the International Crane Foundation, uh, a London-based family planning organization called the Margaret Pike Trust, and Rugurama Hospital in southwestern Uganda. Um, the use of the icon as a crane of family planning is at odds with the image presented in the cartoon at the start of this presentation, in which the cob implies that uh, crane's population is rebounding because they do not know what family planning is. So Ugandans have interpreted crane reproduction in a variety of ways, including as a basis for social service provision related to environmental and health issues. Um, Beyond its significance in personal relationships and social services, the crane has been prominent in discourse about the nation since the colonial origins of the state of Uganda. Uh, the governor slash ornithologist Frederick J. Jackson put it on the flag in 1914. Later, it became the symbol of the colonial police force. Uh, when the first independent government took power, they changed the colonial flag, but they kept the crane. Um, according to the chair of the committee to redesign the flag, the crane stayed because it matched the new national colors and, quote, is friendly, gentle, and shows the peace-loving character of Ugandans, end quote. 
these characteristics of the crane resonated with some Ugandans uh, as archival records from the national competition show uh, to create the new anthem, the new flag and the new coat of arms for the new nation. Um, they reveal considerable support for the bird, especially its peacefulness and its grace. The crane became Uganda's national symbol originally because of top-down decisions, but it retained its position because or with popular support. Um, Ugandan crane and wetland conservationists have tried to use these different kinds of values regarding the bird to promote their programs nationally and internationally. Um, they've also collaborated with crane conservationists globally. In 1987, the government employee who led the creation of wetland conservation programs in Uganda, Paul Mafabi, went to the headquarters of the International Crane Foundation in Wisconsin to learn to organize public counts. Uh, when he returned, he, he coordinated multiple crane counts through the efforts of children and school teachers, the largest of which spanned 10 districts. In the following decades, he became a globally influential policy consultant, including work from the Caribbean to West Africa. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. Um, starting with his work, public counts became vital to assessing the crane population in Uganda. In 2005, the newspaper New Vision helped with the first count to ascertain the full geographical range of crane nests in Uganda by publicizing a research survey for children across the country and the prizes offered by the national men's soccer team, the Cranes. Um, wetland ecologists see cranes as valuable indicators of ecosystem status and therefore have sought to use their prominence in Ugandan society as a flagship to promote conservation. However, people see uh, these indicators and flagships differently depending on how they interpret crane behavior and crane symbolism. Conservationists use different discourses to reach different audiences, through, though sometimes these messages contrast it. Uh, for example, regarding Ugandan nationalism and Ankole politics or pro-monogamy discourses and marriage practices in the places where most cranes live, or older associations of cranes with brides and the more recent anthropomorphizing of male cranes. Still, wetland conservationists uh, focus on the crane reproduction as a place-bound monogamous phenomenon enabled the creation of a campaign that people around the country discussed in a variety of terms that the Kampala-based conservationists had not necessarily anticipated. Uh, these discourses are rooted in a variety of perspectives on cranes that sometimes conflict with each other but the work of the conservationists overall has aligned with the Ugandan government priorities of decentralization and neoliberalism and social service provision uh, from environmental conservation to reproductive issues. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, so uh, it looks like I'm up. So uh, actually, next slide, please. So today I'm gonna talk about a group of very interesting people that are, I call them amateur technologists in Socialist China. So in the 1950s and 1960s, the Chinese socialist state associated radio with national defense and uh, industrialization, encouraging its subject to master radio technology and purchase radio sets. With the closing reading of radio, the name, I mean, this is the name of a popular technical journal, I highlight the central role of amateur technologists in the production and dissemination of scientific knowledge and technological expertise. Building on current scholarship that has noticed the contribution made by non-experts to scientific, de uh, to scientific de development, this essay further argues for the existence and importance of a distinctive amateur knowledge system with an emphasis on practical, inexpensive, and comprehensible knowledge of everyday technology. So in regard to the availability of, techno of technical know-how, a politically repressive era could be technologically democratic for many. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Mm. Yeah, so the uh, first published in 1955, the radio journal is the monthly magazine of radio technology and science that targeted at both specialists in the radio industry as well as non-specialists with an interest in this technological objects. So the radio, uh, sorry, the journal published uh, technical uh, details as well as showcasing science for the layman. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the typical front cover of an uh, issue of the radio journal, which illustrate a bunch of signal corps in camouflage, as well as an advertisement of a radio set 
occupies the back cover of the previous issue on the left. So uh, because radio was the key to revolutionary ventures, advertisements in the radio journal were not at odds with the journal's theme or that they facilitated its readers to acquire this equipment. So they uh, cooperated with the urgency of popularizing te uh, technology and familiarizing people with scientific knowledge, as well as the desire for learning radio expertise for the radio's audience. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so unlike its modern day equivalent, the ad has on this, uh, I mean, this is an example of an ad, of a radio ad on the radio journal. The ad has the outer shell electronic board and circuit diagram of the radio printed together. So the first image on the top, this is straightforward, showing the case, like how what the radio looks like. The second image is more challenging to comprehend what it stands for. Mm, like the second by second image, I mean the image on the bottom. And the third image in the middle is an abstract rendition of the second image and only accessible to a specialist. So this arrangement offers three different manifestations of radio technology, yet representing the same uh, thing. Next slide, please. This is another example of such as. So in this advertisement, the viewers experience a transformative process of moving from the actual appearance to the abstract electronic layout. So from the visible shell to the usually hidden ele electronic board to the imagined circuit diagram. So the style of this and other ads in the radio journal is explanatory rather than promotional, unpacking the radio visually and permitting, or even I would say inviting people to see the blueprints of radio. So in order to understand what is going on in ads in the uh, radio journal, one must first be familiar with radio technology. And behind this, the reality of radio was the governmental dominance of scientific expertise and knowledge production. In socialist China, the notion of intellectual poverty uh, stressed the spread of science knowledge and the availability of technological uh, gadgets over legal authenticity. So because all radio factories were state owned, they care about neither protecting intellectual poverty nor making money, rather, they uh, chose to focus on distributing technology and provided radio blueprints to the radio journal in the form of advertisements. So the radio journal reveals the distinctive conceptualization of authenticity in socialist China as a journal blurs the boundary between genuine and fake. So this surely echoes, but I would say it should not be mistaken for the contemporary ideas of open access or copy left because in the radio journal, the publicly accessible blueprints of radio receivers benefit uh, for most the state monopoly of radio technology, as well as the diffusion of scientific knowledge. Uh, next slide, please. People's craving for teaching and studying radio expertise in the radio journal construct a spear for the circulation of scientific knowledge. Pedagogical articles in the radio journal vary exceedingly in their topics and targeted audience. So one can become proficient in things from transcribing telegrams to assembling a power-free radio receiver on your own. So everyone, regardless of his or her level, can learn something. So uh, I'm afraid that this picture is not really clear, but on the right, this is an article uh, basically telling you how to transcribe a diagram. And on the left, this is a column called Study Space for Amateurs. And this article teach you how to assemble a radio receiver on your own, use uh, materials and stuff that are usually available in the household. So it should be highlighted that many articles published in the radio journal were submissions from its readers. Uh, radio technology induced a steady stream of radio users and fans that were enthusiastic in sharing their knowledge in the radio journal. So this journal, therefore, not only serves as a forum for radio fans to communicate, but also formulates a community, members of which all had equal access to scientific expertise. Since radio technology is also related to electronical engineering, physics, chemistry, and other 
uh, disciplines. The journal was also resourceful and useful for radio practitioners, as well as all students of natural science, especially in the era of limited education and information. Having been equipped with relevant skills, furthermore, readers are encouraged by the radio journal to try to put together their own radio receivers and transmitters without worrying about a patent violation. With the close interconnection between radio and wars in the radio journal, the party rationalized the strategic significance of radio and convinced the masses of the possibility of military conflicts. So to create one's own radio receiver is patriotic and revolutionary, and to misuse radio by listening to foreign broadcast station is an act of treason. Radio then emerged as an ingredient of everyday technological expert. Uh, as an ingredient of everyday technological experiences in Cold War China. In order to achieve revolution, that is to say, one has to be well acquainted with radio technology. Next slide, please. So this paper, uh, as a way of summary, really tries to think through the idea or the political category of the amateur. Maoist science uh, authorities uh, democratized science for readers of the radio journal and other technical journals. Yet, science was never neutral uh, in this social scientific system, but it was re reality state sponsored distribution of knowledge, and it was about the normative usage of radio and other technology. So the radio journal assured its readers that expertise could be learned and taught, and technology can be homemade or bought at all with ease. Nevertheless, it also instilled into them the narrative that studying radio was for revolutionary aims, and uh, by implication, in order to achieve revolution, one had to be well-versed in radio technology and natural sciences. Having accepted these ideas, the readers of the radio magazine, they would passionately take part in the governmental schemes of science dissemination and mass science. So the radio journal popularized science and made radio fans voluntarily stick together, ensuring the survival of a population with scientific knowledge, who I would argue would play a major role in the political history of both Maoist and post Mao China. So there are lots of discussion on citizen science as we have heard in the past three uh, days of this workshop, but I really, and this paper really want to think about who is the political subject in the issue of citizen science. In the case of Mao's China, the uh, the practitioners, the amateur the, the amateur technologists of radio technology, they have to be, uh, you know, of certain political category, not deemed by the state as a dangerous element or as a counter revolutionary. So by thinking about the issue of amateur technolo technologists and, and the amateur science uh, against the backdrop of citizen science, we may uh, start to work toward an alternative history of knowledge production with the emphasis on the amateur, on the citizen, and the other relevant categories. Uh, that's it, thank you. Great, thank you all for those amazing um, presentations. And um, for folks who haven't read the papers um, that are available online, I really encourage you because they go into some really um, great detail about the topics that were presented. I found them uh, really interesting to read together. Um, I have a couple of questions to, to kick things off, but I encourage folks who are watching uh, at home to uh, submit your own questions using the, Q using the Q and A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, but perhaps we'll just uh, start today. So, so we've been we've been talking throughout the week about. Uh, well, I guess we started this week talking about how citizen science, and in some cases, back uh, to, to 18th century uh, processes of knowledge production, kind of relying upon networks of expertise and, and reportage. Um, but we've also been talking about in the past couple of days about how citizen science can be used to serve a systematic. That all of your papers are, are really um, hitting on that point. So based on, on uh, that you're, you're working um, through, uh, do you see citizen science performing a different kind of function uh, in more recent historical uh, contexts and examples? And to what extent uh, were the, science, the citizen science initiatives that you write about uh, used to promote ideas about national uh, or cultural belonging 
as well as 20th century scientific and technological knowledge. And I think uh, Ying Xuan, you uh, start to get at that at the end of your, your remarks. So um, I'll, I'll just open it up. Uh, whoever wants to, to go first would like to take a stab at that. Um, feel free. Maybe I can just uh, say a couple of words uh, because I think I'm really trying to demonstrate in the paper that this uh, nationalist uh, rhetoric was quite important and it's it's indeed striking when you read the letters um, to see to what extent uh, these Soviet innovators um, interiorized and, and, and employed strategically the, the emerging rhetoric of the Cold War and uh, especially the Soviet American um rivalry to to advance basically their um their goals so i think that's uh, of course on the one hand it's uh, it can be seen as a very top down story that the soviet state was very successful in instilling these values um but of course uh, i think my materials also give uh, examples of uh, how people i think use this quite strategically and they knew uh, sort of what uh, levers would give them most success with their applications and what kind of language should they use if they really want to advance their, their course. So in, in my sources, this element is definitely very uh, important. Great. Um, John, you want to jump in? Thank you. Yeah, I um, thank you very much for both of those questions. They, they give me a lot to think about. Um, and I think they fit really closely together for my paper. Um, in terms of recent changes in citizen science in Uganda, I think probably the most obvious and important dynamic to think about for changes across the 20th century would be uh, changes in the racial composition of people who are involved in participating in projects and producing knowledge and the different roles that people have. Um, that's something that began to change slowly, I think in the 1980s, at least in Uganda. Um, there were uh, there were also African people involved in the National Park Service um, starting, you know, in the, in, in the 1950s, even in the late colonial era. But in terms of discussing citizen science, I think um, that's something that began in the, in the 70s and the 80s. The wildlife clubs that um, engage children in these activities, that's something that began in the 70s. And so, yeah, the, 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 these racial changes um, it, it, and as something, you know, creating a, this um, in, independent nation is part of also, I think why the government pursued in particular the wetland theme, because after speaking with some of the people who were involved in creating these policies, they also um, discussed the importance of the idea that the Ramsar Bureau, the, the, the organizing body for wetland conservation internationally, um, they found it to be a relatively equitable and open organization. And so in terms of creating a new nation and an international profile for it, um, and working with people across different lines that way, they found it valuable in that way. So I think that the, the two questions might connect in that way for me anyway. Great, thank you. Um, Ying Xuan? Yeah, so, I, I could, so actually can I share my screen to get sure. back to one of my slides? Um, yes. Okay, so, uh, you know, as you can see in this slide, so this kind of, uh, militants theme is really common in both the radio journal and other publications in this time that really, you know, they really work to associate, uh, as I said, associate radio with national defense and the industrialization. So um, to uh, going back to your question, I think this is very important to think about uh, both radio technology as well as the broader, my broader theme of uh, amateur technologists or amateur science um, against the backdrop of, I mean, not only national imagination or nationalism, but also uh, socialism, right? So to think about, you know, as the uh, picture I just showed indicates, this really the ideal that people should work together, they should master this technology together as a way to defend their country from the outside enemy. I mean, that could either be the US or the Soviet Union. Uh, but, the, but the important thing is this really this interconnection between science, between amateur science and the, 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 the idea of national belong, the idea of national belonging uh, is here, uh, you know, as a, as, as a, as a 
as a mechanism to support the success of amateur science. I mean, people, they were, they would love to uh, use and uh, master radio technology, not only because this is, you know, one of the most effective means of, tele of telecommunication for a long time, but also uh, radio had this connotation of protecting our country against an imagined enemy. Great, and I actually think that there's some great um, parallels between your paper, uh, Yingchuan and, and Pavel's and sort of thinking about these uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, technical know-how initiatives as, as being a product of necessity and, 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 and listening to Pavel's um, remarks, I'm struck too by, by how scale and sort of um, just that, you know, these, these countries are very, are very big. I think these, these are large uh, areas and, and thinking about how, um, how these projects are sort of are bringing people together. I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, how these, these, um, these citizen science projects and, and, and also this journal is being used as a way to, to both build community uh, as well as to, to promote um, scientific know-how. Mm. So I guess I guess the question would be uh, that how the technical journals per se they would uh, promote the building, right? So mm, you know, as I just said, so first there is this uh, visual representation, uh, this uh, visual association between technology and and national defense, and also you know, in this uh, really nice column. They, uh, so this is also, uh, I think someone in the Q&A section also asked me the question that is there any way uh, to show that the radio, uh, sorry, the journal is actually encouraging people to share their, like their tips of using radio. So my answer will be yes. So, you know, the radio is, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the radio journal is actually, uh, uh, is he asking people to contribute uh, essays and articles and tips to the journal? And uh, all of those are framed under the general, uh, you know, framework of uh, being patriot, uh, being patriot, and uh, you know, to be able to master radio uh, technology to serve your country as well as to help your fellow technologists to uh, use and master this technology as well. So even though I would say that, you know, the points or that amateur technology is indeed different uh, with the other two uh, presentation in a way that there is not, so, I mean, probably the practitioners of amateur technology and science they were not actively, uh, you know, thinking about themselves as participants in this scheme of national science or nationalism, but they were, uh, as I said, indeed encouraged by this technical journal and other uh, state-controlled uh, uh, outlets to uh, gain and share their knowledge as a part of the national science system and to contribute for the quote unquote greater good of science and technology community. Yeah. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, actually, a question, uh, interesting question here for, for John. Uh, and it says, so the question reads, it sounds like in addition to monogamy, uh, the campaign is also pushing heteronormativity. Uh, are there larger uh, implications as a result of this, um, either for the citizen science projects or for a sort of more national projects in Uganda? All right, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think maybe one thing to begin by noting is um, something that I'm trying to emphasize uh, in, in my argumentation is the extent to which different people participating in this campaign are doing so independently of each other and taking different perspectives on what's going on. And so, yeah, th this, is, this is a question I've been thinking about in terms of, you know, where does heteronormativity uh, get introduced into um, the discussion? Because it's, it's there in some cases and it's, it's not there in others. And I think the, the two that I led with are, are probably 
the main examples where I see it. It's, it I see it in the in the cartoon and you know in, in the Doctor Love article. Um, in the materials from Nature Uganda, uh, I, I would say that it's it's generally not part of the messaging. Um, but what it means is that uh, um, there is this. Uh, yeah, it, it's part of the broader ability of people to interpret these messagings, uh, messages about monogamy and reproduction in a variety of ways. Um, and so, yes, I said, you know, there are social implications of putting uh, something out there that can be interpreted in, in different ways. And that I, I think that speaks in part to, you know, the, the first title, of, the first half of the title of um, our symposium, the, the promises as well as pitfalls of citizen science. Um, I mean, in, in, in terms of the extent to which discussions about cranes are reinforcing heteronormativity in Uganda, I probably rank it relatively low on the list. Um, but, you, um, you know, it can certainly be interpreted in, uh, in that way. You're definitely right about that. Great. Thanks so much. Um, question for Pavel, um, for, for folks who maybe didn't have an opportunity to, to uh, dig into your paper, uh, there's a couple questions here uh, asking for you to talk a little bit more about um, uh, how Soviet clinical trial protocols uh, differed from um, protocols in the United States and, and maybe setting that um, setting those those uh, different methods up so, so that people can, can better understand your arguments about uh, effectiveness versus efficacy. Yes, thanks. Um, so the effectiveness uh, versus efficacy is, of course, a million dollar question that I and my colleagues are trying to, to answer in this larger project. Uh, so why did they insist on uh, this specific um, model of uh, drug testing? And the, the official Soviet answer would, of course, lie in the ethical field. So they would say that, uh, for example, the use of uh, placebos is unethical and more generally, uh, conducting any human experiments um, is uh, questionable from the ethical point of view. So every new drug discovery uh, should be done in the context of uh, treatment. There, of course, uh, there are other considerations and I think it's important to bring uh, economic issues which the Soviets themselves acknowledged. So they said uh, that the uh, clinical trial system as it evolved in the US is basically very uh, wasteful, apart from being remote from clinical realities on, on the ground. And uh, I think you can see quite a bit this uh, economic imperative in the politics of uh, socialist uh, pharmacological innovation um, that uh, a lot of uh, stages in the creation of uh, new knowledge can be just uh, skipped and uh, the resulting knowledge would still uh, hold and uh, would still be you know, ethical according to, uh, to the Soviet standards. And um, the, the question about the, the protocols is also quite difficult to, to answer because I think the, you know, the important point to know is that there was no uh, uniform protocol, but at the same time that the Soviets insisted on the need of clinical trials very early. Um, so you can already see some um, legal initiatives already in the 1920s postulating that every new pharmaceutical should just should be subject uh, to testing before being allowed to uh, to be used. And um, in general, uh, the system looked like this: um, a research institute or maybe a medical school uh, that. Uh, developed an experimental drug, uh, sent uh, documentation to the pharmacological committee, um, enclosing the results of the experimental studies, uh, also postulating the need for a new drug. And that's another important point that uh, sort of is, is relevant for socialist pharma politics, that um, when there is no need for an extra drug, then there is no need to develop one. And in a state control system, you can actually uh, sort of uh, achieve this uh, with relatively good results. Um, and then the Oncological Committee decided uh, how many clinical trials should run and at which institutions. And it's a really interesting part of the story. How did they decide? What were the factors? How many trials did they deem sufficient? Uh, how did they select the institutions? And then each institution 
uh, would basically run their own trial according to the kind of patients that they had. And uh, they devise their own scheme and send the results back to Moscow. Uh, then they you know, might order additional trials if they were not sure, or they would just issue a decision on whether a new drug uh, could enter the Soviet uh, medical market. Um, and uh, just maybe finally to, to reply to the question about uh, informed consent forms. Uh, of, of course, you know, informed consent forms uh, are an important step. And this is actually something that was lacking in the Soviet model. Um, it was, you know, much more kind of patriarchal in, in, in this sense and relying also on authority of uh, a physician until you know, very late in the 1980s. Um, but I would still uh, doubt that the simple act of introducing informed consent forms uh, automatically uh, solves all bioethical issues, because otherwise there would be no need for bioethics for you know half of the century, I think 60 years now. Uh, there are of course other ethical questions which emerge in clinical trials. Uh, so do people really understand what they sign? What are their motivations? Are the financial motivations um, involved? Uh, where are the trials being held? And again, uh, how the choice of these countries and locations might impact the motivations? Uh, are there clinical trials on, on women, for example? Um, you know, there are lots of things which uh, still uh, arise, uh, even though we have uh, informed consent forms uh, and they arise in the US and globally. Um, there are, of course, uh, you know, other ethical questions that arise in, in the Soviet Union. And uh, I actually talk a little bit about them in the paper and uh, also in uh, another paper, which, I, which was already published and uh, I referenced it also uh, in this text. So maybe you could also have a look and uh, see more examples of this. Thanks for the questions, everyone. Great, thank you so much. We're quickly running out of time. Um, so I, I wanted to bring up a point that I think we haven't seen so much in, in the papers presented thus far in this, this conference, and that's about the role of, of communications and media. Uh, and I was struck that that both uh, John and, and Ying Xuan, both of you, uh, journals and newspapers, uh, kind of communications technologies, play a real, really critical role uh, in, in in both the promotion of um, uh, citizen science work, but also in in both expected and unexpected ways. Um, so I, I guess it's a, a two part question. So so one, I was hoping that you could give us a better sense, uh, a of of who is producing. Uh, the, the newspapers and journals that you, you talk about in your papers, uh, also about the readership. And then if you could think a little bit about um, uh, what role uh, communications plays in both helping and hindering citizen science. You know, John, if you wanna start. Uh, Great, thanks. Um, yeah, that's a dynamic that I'm trying to look at a lot. Um, thank you for that question. Um, so in terms of who's producing and who's reading, who's producing the new vision, is it's the government it, and it's it, in particular it was established the same year that the new regime took power um, in 1986 and it, uh, the new resistance movement is the name of the political party that's been in power since 86 um, that banned wetland drainage in 1986 that created this newspaper in 1986. One of the things that the government the current regime rhetorically uses to distinguish itself from previous Ugandan governments has been uh, focused on environmental conservation and so um, one of the recurring messages in New Vision is drawing attention to uh, Ugandan government policies against uh, or in favor of conservation and trying to bring people on board with those. And so that's, it's a bit of a recurring theme in the paper because rhetorically it's important to the government in terms of implementation is obviously that's a whole other question. Um, in terms of who's reading it, uh, so as I said, it's, it's really hard to get statistics because they're trade secrets. I, I found in an advertisement from the newspaper to potential advertisers um, that they were selling, I think maybe about 100,000 copies a year in the early 2000s, about 50% of which were in Kampala and about 50% of which were outside the capital city in the country. Um, and I think it's safe to assume that predominantly those are being read in towns, that's where they'll be sold. Um, the number might be a bit misleading, though, because newspapers, you know, will be passed from person to person. Um, but just the fact that they're written in English um, is a certain barrier to participation in many parts of Uganda. Less so today, um, but um, reading and writing are uh, you know, maybe maybe different questions. But less so today. But so maybe that's another thing that we could think of in terms of changing like citizen science recently in Uganda. But um, 
Yeah, definitely major barriers in terms of geography and ability to read certain languages limits who's participating in this stuff. Great, uh, Ying Xuan, um, similar question. Do you have a sense about um, who's producing your, uh, your, your journal, who's reading it, um, how it's helping and hindering? I know you talk about it a little, but if you, if you have any other thoughts to expand upon. Yeah, so the majority of the, the article were still actually pr uh, produced by professional editors and authors. So the uh, journal was actually published by the, I think the name is that like, uh, Post and the Communication Publishing House. So this is a subsidy of the Ministry of, of Communication. So this is a state-run, uh, state-run, uh, say, initiative. But I mean, that doesn't make a huge difference because basically everything was state-run in, in the socialist period in socialist China. So, but uh, as I just said, there were also a significant portion of readers' uh, submission uh, so who's reading this? So this is also actually the question that appears in the Q and A section. Uh, so I have one uh, statistic, uh, statistics that states the highest circulation of the journal reached two uh, reached two million. So, but I think this number really underestimates the influence of the journal because it was very common to, you know people, uh, many people reading the same journal, or even there were places, you know, like reading room in a work unit or libraries, where even though the circulation is too million, I think it can reach a lot more people than that. Uh, yeah, and how is that, uh, you know, I do talk a lot about how the journal actually impact on its readers. So I do have, you know, more uh, sources in other parts of this project. And the, mm, I think, I mean, there's also a question about like, what's the radio is like right now. So actually it still existing right now, even though it, in, it is a much uh, less well-known or say much less important, it's, has already become a specialist journal for people in the radio industry and the uh, you know ordinary like amateur radio fans i don't think those i mean i don't think there there are lots of amateur radio fans existing as for today and uh, not yeah so this is a really niche market so yeah uh, and also there are two questions about computers so no, I don't think there are similar journals uh, about uh, computers because you know we have the internet, we have BBS, so the journal format doesn't really make sense in the internet age. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, so I want to ask one one final question just to bring us to a close, um, and 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 this really applies for all of you, and and that's um, to what extent um, does citizen science as a concept? Uh, imply or reproduce Western understandings of scientific practice or knowledge production, or rather, to what extent is it a strategy to support diversity in site-specific or embodied knowledge practices? I, I don't know, Pavel, if you want to take the first stab and yeah, say yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. I think it's uh, one of the central concerns for. Uh, for me, uh, coming in with this paper on the Soviet Union uh, to the symposium of how we can translate, you know, the Western uh, term of citizen science, but also as I've learned uh, reading the papers and listening to the talks that there are other uh, similar, but uh, you know, yet uh, different in their meanings concepts. You know, amateur science is one. We also have heard about community science and so on and so forth. So there are important distinctions, right? Um, but here I'm still, you know, for the time being, I'm playing with this concept of citizen science, just really trying to reimagine what a citizen can mean in a state socialist con uh, context, because obviously um, the actors of this story, they are citizens of the Soviet Union, they have the citizenship and it's, it's uh, recognized as that. Um, but Soviet citizenship, of course, is quite uh, different from uh, Western one. And maybe that's one direction in which I can um, sort of develop this paper. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not quite sure whether um, there is uh, 
an explicit import of the concept, right? Because I think that the, the actors that I talk about, they don't necessarily see themselves in these terms as, as citizen scientists, but they do employ these uh, local Soviet terms uh, that I mentioned, right? That they're thinking they're participating in this efficiency drive or you know, rationalization drive, uh, that they're inventors. And uh, this is something which is uh, very much uh, reflected in their um, identity. Um, there was an interesting observation that was made uh, you know, in the question that it might also help promote some more you know, local vernacular um, versions of uh, science and support diversity more generally. Um, as I mentioned, I think on the surface it does. So there are some um, participants in this story, um, you know, for, for example, you know, ethnic uh, Uzbek, Mumijan Aliyev is one you know, hero in my paper. Um, but I'm not sure whether his citizen science uh, is uh, Uzbek, right? So whether there is something which is um, so central for his project that it can be described in this kind of more local vernacular terms of benefiting a particular community. I think all of them rather stress their allegiance to a larger Soviet project, which again brings us to the discussions of nationalism and autarky in the emerging. Cold War, but thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, Yingsheng or uh, John, very quick, uh, any thoughts to add? Yeah, um, I, uh, again, I, I like this question a lot. I think it's an important one for us to be thinking about and it's part of what I'm trying to think of in all the chapters of my dissertation, not just this one, but it's, um, I guess it, one thing to consider is that I think there's probably a, a lot of citizen science initiatives end up manifesting right somewhere between these two different forms that you described on one hand, site-specific and embodied knowledge is on the other hand, hegemonic, hegemonic and nationalist directives. Um, for example, when I think about the cranes, crane conservation began as a state directive, um, but it ended up uh, being something that the state largely pulled away from and NGOs entered, not only because of neoliberalism, which I alluded to, but another element that I didn't discuss is the fact that um, crane conservation aligns with the conservation of a certain kind of ecosystem um, and not conservation of others. Uh, in particular, um, it, it didn't work with rice farming, which a lot of other, which a lot of Ugandan farmers wanted to pursue, and which a lot of Ugandan conservationists, particularly government conservationists, ended up coming around on because rice farms can support so many different birds. You know, you lose cranes, but you gain hundreds of other bird species. And so conservationists uh, employed by the government ended up you know, largely moving away from this crane-based focusing and it became really the, the domain of the NGOs. Um, and so that's one thing to consider is, you know, the extent to which these things become muddled. And then on the other end, um, on the community side, um, yeah, you, you can see the manifestation of older forms of knowledge about wetlands in community conservation agreements. Um, I think the, the best example is the extent, in, in Uganda, the best example is the extent to which these agreements uh, maintain that certain areas should be reserved for um, papyrus, which grows um, abundantly in Uganda if, um, if you don't do things to remove it. Um, and I think, um, you know, ultimately the, the manifestation of that in a conservation agreement is, is stripped of a lot of, you know, the site specific knowledge aspect of it. And so, you know, that's something to consider. Um, but on the other hand, it, it, it is, you know, shaping the the actual implementation of whatever outside directive is coming. So I don't know, this, I think both are always going on. Great. Uh, Ying Xuan, 30 second response. Okay. So uh, I think citizen science can be a very productive uh, concept as, as long as we uh, keep being critical about what citizen means. So in my case, you know, uh, so the Mark series, uh, any Merrifield, so he wrote a book on the amateur, and he really understand the amateur spirit as a kind of independent skin, uh, independent thinking against capitalist alienation, against this you know uh, specialized labor, against this like uh, the requirement to 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 the requirement of uh, of specialization. So if we think about citizen. Uh, broadly as the larger concept, not only 
from the political perspective, but also from social perspective, as you know, John just mentioned about community participation. So I think we are gonna be able to reach a more critical understanding of not on of not only citizen science, but also other issues about citizenism, uh, citizenship, nationalism, and uh, you know other concepts and the discourses. Um, well, thank you all again for these really great presentations and to uh, the folks for sticking around a little bit longer. Um, I really do encourage you to engage with the papers. Uh, a round of applause virtually. Uh, I'll do it from here. <laughs> Sorry that the rest of you can't see the clapping that's happening at home. And I encourage you all to join us again at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern time for our uh, final showcase for the week, uh, which asks, are we alone in the universe? And we'll talk about the work that SETI is doing to explore extraterrestrial life. Um, so with that, um, thank you all again. And uh, I look forward to seeing this work uh, continue to develop.